Uh, hello, uh, welcome to the second session. So we have uh, the next lecture by Dr. Peter Petrichki, and he will be. He's actually uh, done many pioneering works, especially on the heavy quark suppression on the lattice, the equation of state, and amongst others. And he will tell us about uh, studying thermal matter on the lattice. So, uh, as Sayatan said, I'm going to talk about uh, the strong interacting matter uh, and its new phases uh, at high temperature. And most of my studies will be about uh, lattice QCD. But of course, uh, I will, in, at least in this lecture, I will try to present a broader picture. And uh, also, when I will present the lattice result, I will put it in the context of a broader picture uh, in general. So uh, when we study uh, strong interacting matter, of course, there is a theory in the experiment. And on the theory, we have several tools to study matter, uh, strong interacting matter in extreme condition, meaning very high temperature or very high density. And uh, those include, uh, of course, lattice and supercomputing. Uh, at low temperature and low density, we could use effective field theory of strong interaction, a chiral perturbation theory, a relativistic virial expansion, and we'll discuss those in particular today. And at high temperature and high density, we have uh, our perturbation theory and weak coupling expansion uh, to deal with the problem. And in particular, uh, it's also very useful to use effective field theory language as well there. And there's a relevant effective theory approach is called the dimension reduced effective field theory. Now on the experimental side, that's a, uh, a large effort as well. So it started in late 80s, beginning of 90s, with heavy iron experiments at uh, AGS and SPS in CERN. And those were covering a, a relatively low energy, so from 1 to 70 uh, GV in center of mass energies. Uh, and then at present, uh, starting in, in kind of this millennia, uh, the rig started, and now it collides ions, uh, gold ions, and uh, wide uh, range of energies from the lowest being 1.5 GV to 200 GV, and LHC experiments, they go to uh, 276 and 5.5 TV. And of course, that's not only facilities which, uh, uh, these are only for the only facilities right now, but also in the future, uh, new facilities are planned to do heavy iron experiments, in particular uh, the compressed bar baryon matter experiment at FAIR in GSI, and as well as nickel in Russia, and th those are uh, concentrated in the low energy end of, of the experiments from 1 to 10 GV. <clears throat> now, of course, <clears throat> here I show uh, the two main experiments, which uh, I will mostly discuss. That's uh, uh, Rick uh, with uh, colliding gold ions uh, up to 200 mass GV. And the energy density produces experiment is pretty high. It's between 15 to uh, uh, 30 GV uh, per Fermi cube, depending on when, when do you assume that the system thermalizes. And at LHC, we have three experiments at much higher energy of almost an order of magnitude. And here, the energy density at very initial stage at least could reach 100 GV per Fermi cube. So really, we are talking about energy density, which are much uh, larger than typical energy density inside of hadrons, and, and of course, they're so high that, of uh, course, thinking that the matter produced there will be purely hadronic is kind of silly. So, really, we're talking about uh, matter which is uh, has to be thought uh, in, described in terms of quarks and gluons, so in protonic language, um, uh, by all means. Also, the thermalization, so when the system actually thermalizes, it's still an open question. Uh, now, of course, on the lattice QCD, we have uh, also large equipment, but of course, on smaller scale. So, uh, what we need for lattice QCD is supercomputing. So, we need machines, uh, but, but the very biggest uh, computers you could get to. And here I show some of the computers I, uh, the collaboration of mine have been used in the past several years. And those, of course, that's kind of obsolete, at least for 2013, but in 2013, those were among uh, the fastest machines in the world. And uh, kind of located in supercomputer center in the US. Okay, uh, so somehow uh, to understand the entire problem, it's probably worth go back uh, way in the past. And actually, uh, this 
area of research didn't start it in the 80s or 90s. It started much earlier, as essentially as soon as hadron were discovered. So right in the 50s, it was pointed out by Pomeranchuk that uh, hadronic matter cannot exist at very high temperature because already in the 50s we knew that hadrons, in particular proton, has a finite size. And that means that if you try to heat up the, uh, heat up the matter, it will produce more and more hadrons. And eventually, because of their finite size, these hadrons will start overlapping. So you have to pack uh, hadrons in a volume which is much smaller eventually than uh, uh, the, si the size of the hadron itself. So somehow there is, should be a limiting temperature beyond which uh, this uh, concept of hadron will no longer make sense. Of course, back then it wasn't at all clear uh, what will happen, but, but the kind of uh, already there, uh, it was postulated that eventually the, if the, temp the inverse temperature becomes much uh, smaller than the size of the hadrons, the concept of hadronic matter won't make sense. Of course, it continued with Hagedorn, who kind of uh, analyzing the experimental data uh, on hadron scattering discovered that the resonances producing the scattering, uh, the, uh, the number of resonances producing scattering grows approximately exponentially, so there is an increasing density of states uh, with, uh, as you go to higher energy, and then of course because of this increasing density of states, uh, you could produce many states which otherwise would be Boltzmann suppressed, but this Boltzmann suppression will be compensated by uh, essentially increasing density. And this exponential uh, or nearly exponential increase in density of hadronic states then also leads to uh, what uh, Hagerin calls a limiting temperature beyond certain temperature, essentially the density uh, of states compensates the Boltzmann suppression and eventually uh, the partition function evaluated in this a hadron gas will diverge. Uh, the more modern uh, understanding of this limited temperature actually was uh, proposed by uh, Kabibo and uh, Parisi, as well as uh, Collins and Perry. And that, of course, they, uh, that's when QCD was discovered, and they realized that this limiting temperature is not really, shouldn't be considered a limiting temperature, but really uh, it should be thought of uh, uh, as, as a consequence of asymptotic freedom. Uh, that is, if the temperature is too high and hadronic, uh, hadronic description doesn't work, then uh, one should uh, think about of qu a quark degrees of freedom because you're entering the phase where quarks become weakly interacting due to asymptotic freedom, and therefore uh, you should think of this limiting temperature as a transition temperature from hadronic degrees of freedom to quark degrees of freedom. And essentially the same was argument by Collins and Perry. If you, they were arguing that if you increase the uh, density uh, of, of matter, or baryon density of the matter beyond certain point, because of asymptotic freedom, the, uh, uh, the quarks would be the proper uh, degrees of freedom. In other words, if the uh, chemical potential in your finite density system is beyond much, much beyond lambda QCD, then the coupling applies and due to asymptotic freedom and quarks will be uh, the dominant uh, degrees of freedom. So therefore, you go from a hadron, a hadronic, dense hadronic system to a dense quark uh, gas. Okay, so that's how you could visualize a picture, which I just said before. Uh, so you start out with uh, hadronic matter, and of course, uh, at low temperature, you have uh, kind of hadrons are well defined degrees of freedom. So you could think of hadrons as being back containing three quarks. And, and of course, this, uh, you have a relatively few hadrons per unit volume. But as you start to increase the uh, temperature, right? It's a relativistic system. So you could uh, produce more and more particles, more and more hadrons. And eventually, at high enough temperature or density, when you start to compress them, uh, these hadronic bags start to overlap, and then the idea of, of quarks being confined inside the bag or belonging to a particular hadron is no longer ap uh, applicable, really, because um, now the hadronic bags start to overlap, so it, it it's becomes difficult to decide which quarks belong to which hadron. Now, of course, if you push this uh, density and temperature high enough, uh, the picture somehow becomes like this, and that all these uh, hadronic bags coalesce and form one big bag of or which contains all the quarks and gluons. And here, of course, the idea of, of quarks and, and gluons belonging to a particular hadrons makes no sense whatsoever. And that's a, a, a quark, uh, stage, uh, state of the matter which we call 
uh, coagulum plasma, and uh, the uh, name of coagulum plasma was invented by Edward Shurek, and that essentially analogous to the idea of usual plasma, because what happens here is that if you uh, go to very high temperature, then the dominant uh, scale is a temperature, so the distance between your partners is actually the inverse of the temperature, and so it, you're talking about short distances, and because of asymptotic freedom, the coupling is much smaller than one, so you could think of it as, as essentially as electrom, uh, electromagnetic plasma in some sense. And then, of course, because you have the uh, coupling, there is also, you could throw, and I will discuss in a minute, you have color uh, electric screening, like in ordinary plasma, so it's to the first approximation, uh, this bag of quarks and gluons at this high temperature is, is, uh, behaves similarly or has very uh, s uh, similar properties to usual plasma, and therefore uh, the name quark gluon plasma was invented. Now, if you estimate at what temperature or densities uh, that happen, so you could estimate it to be a uh, density of a few hundred MeV, so it's in ter terms if you want to convert it on kind of more conventional units, you end up with uh, uh, 10 to 12 Kelvin, which is 100 million times hotter than the interior sun, so that's really extremely high temperature, and uh, the density uh, is typically 5 to 10 times larger than the nuclear matter density. So, uh, all, all in all, you could think of uh, about uh, the structure of... Uh, uh, stronger interacting matter in terms of the phase diagram where you have different axes, uh, you have the temperature axis and you have the axis uh, uh, of the chemical potential which uh, controls mostly the baryon density and at low temperature, low density, you have the hadron gas where you have uh, confinement, quark confinement quark, uh, uh, and gluon confinement to be precise and chiral symmetry breaking which I will discuss in a moment and then at high temperature you have essentially quark gluon plasma uh, where you have color electric uh, screening. And as of course, then the question is what is a phase boundary? And, and we know now from lattice QCD calculations that actually the phase boundary is not, uh, not a phase transition but a crossover for most of the time. But at large baryon density, it's possible that there will be a first order phase transition. And uh, then, then you have, if you, there is a first order phase transition at high baryon density and a crossover at low baryon density, then there should be a critical endpoint, so that, which also calls a chiral critical point, and that essentially subject to search in experimental program at RIC and later in other experiments like uh, at uh, FAIR. So now, unfortunately, uh, what we can say about the phase diagram uh, from lattice QCD is, is not that much, so certainly we cannot do uh, the large uh, baryon density region, and that's uh, due to the infamous sun problem uh, in Monte Carlo sampling. So most of, of the part of the phase diagram which we could cover by lattice QCD is limited to high temperature and moderately small, uh, moderately large baryon density. Certainly the high baryon density is not accessible. As you increase the temperature, uh, then what's the relevant parameter is mu, the chemical potential over T, so high temperature also means that in principle you could go to larger uh, chemical potential in physical units, but, but the ratio mu over T can never be large, so it's essentially this, this diagonal piece of the phase diagram that you could explore. Now, of course, you could ask where such a matter exists, uh, why it's interesting. Uh, so somehow, uh, Studying matter in extreme condition, it uh, t will tell you something about the basic property of strong interactions, such as uh, confinement and chiral symmetry restoration, the potential consequences for compact stars and binaries, the transient objects, uh, because there you have to know what are the boundaries of hadronic matter, so up to which temperature and density you could uh, sensibly uh, try to describe what's going on in terms of hadronic degrees of freedom, and also cosmological uh, consequences uh, in the early universe. Uh, one example is axion uh, uh, cos uh, cosmology. So if you think of axion as a dark matter candidate, then the abundance is also turns out to be influenced by uh, QCD physics, namely by uh, QCD topological susceptibility. Okay, so now back to basics. So uh, of course when you study QCD at finite temperature, uh, the symmetries uh, 
play an important role. And of course, that's not particular to QCD if you generally think of, of phase transitions, uh, for understanding phase transition and, uh, and universality of phase transition, symmetry is a central role. So when you talk about symmetries in QCD, one of the symmetries is a, perhaps one of the most important symmetries is a chiral symmetry. And that stems to the fact that if you look at the physical value of the quark mass, or at least two of the lightest quark mass up and down, they're much smaller than lambda QCD. So the QCD Lagrangian has an approximate symmetry in which you could transform, uh, make a unitary transformation of the left and right component of the quark fields. And the Lagrangian is invariant under such unitary transformation. So you could separately rotate uh, the left and uh, right fields in the quark Lagrangian, uh, and um, the Lagrangian won't change. Now, of course, we know that in QCD this symmetry is broken. Uh, it's broken by the non-zero expectation value of the quark condensate. So if you calculate the expectation of psi bar psi, you could rewrite it as, in terms of left and right component, as, as uh, psi left bar uh, psi right plus psi ref, uh, right bar ps uh, psi left. And this is non-zero, which means that this condensate is not invariant under rotation, in independent rotation of left and right. And uh, that, of course, uh, this uh, symmetry is spontaneously broken. So you have a number of Gaussian realization of this symmetry. And, and QCD has Gaussian bosons, and uh, those are the pines. Uh, now, the kind of important physical consequences of uh, of this uh, symmetry breaking, namely that uh, hadrons of different uh, parity have very different masses. So naively, we would expect that if that would be an exact symmetry, of course, then uh, hadrons with different parities would have similar masses, but that's not true. That's not realized in, in nature. And the other important consequences, which uh, kind of uh, in particular important for uh, QCD at uh, non-zero temperature, is that uh, hadrons at low energies uh, are interacting weakly. So although uh, you would think of QCD in the low energy regime as a strongly coupled, and they, indeed it's very strongly coupled in terms of quarks and gluon degrees of freedom, but if you go to the Goldstone bosons of the series, the Goldstone bosons of the series are very weakly interacting as well as low energy, uh, as the energy is low. So pines essentially form a weakly interacting gas. Uh, then of course there is an axial symmetry, which is kind of uh, subspecies of the chiral symmetry, except that now this uh, unitary transformation is uh, a flav flavor singlet. So it's a UA1. Instead of SU2 axial, you have a UA1 axial. And here you do the same rotation, uh, but, uh, but without uh, the uh, flavor generator TA. And this symmetry, of course, not spontaneously broken, is broken by the anomaly. So if you look at uh, the partial conservation of the axial charge, it's essentially, uh, at, uh, if you do just a simple one-loop calculation, you can uh, show that it's related to the expectation value of the field strength tensor and its uh, uh, dual. And, and this object essentially is nothing but uh, the uh, topological charge of QCD. And it also has an important con a consequence uh, that the Eaton prime meson, which is a pseudo-scalar, uh, is much larger than all the other ones. And of course, the pion and a naught mass difference is also huge. So now, what happens to those symmetries uh, if you go to high temperature? Obviously, uh, the fact that the chiral condensate is non-zero uh, is somehow the non-perturbative feature of QCD. But as you go to high temperature, as I argued, asymptotic freedom applies, and therefore, a temperature much larger than lambda QCD, there should be no room for non-perturbative physics, uh, at least naively, and you would expect that uh, the chiral condensate the expectation value of psi bar psi is zero. So you could say that at high temperature, uh, the chiral symmetry is restored. So you have one symmetry which is broken at low temperature, restored at high temperature. So you could think of the phase transition kind of linked to these symmetries. Uh, then UA ax axial symmetry is also somehow related to non-perturbative, uh, but it's kind of not a spontaneous symmetry breaking. It's kind of always broken by anomaly. And, uh, and then the question is, what, what's the role of anomaly? To what extent is non-perturbative? To what extent is perturbative? And it's not totally uh, understood right now, but, but the common law or common wisdom is that 
it gets effectively restored at high enough temperature. Yes. Oh. Yeah, I, I think it's a typo. I mean, there should be no A. That's right. So it's just J mu. So sorry about that. Yeah, it's a typo. I will fix it before posting the lectures. <laughs> uh, yeah, but but the problem is, yeah, I, I, I have I have to. It's better if I just define it. Be, I, pro, I may have meant it Excel. I just forgot that that that. Uh, uh, of course, I use A for the color label here, so that that's why the confusion. So I, I probably should define what GMU is, but but yeah, it's probably meant to be Excel. But but then then I have to use some other indices here. Uh, now, at, uh, high temperatures, there is an additional symmetry which is uh, called the central symmetry or the three symmetry, and that's. Uh, uh, comes from the fact that uh, there is invariance on the global gauge transformation. So if you look at the, the partition function or the pressure of QCD, it's invariant if you take a uh, transformation which leaves uh, the gauge field uh, periodic up to a, well, up to a phase which is uh, kind of cube, uh, cubic root of unity. So I, uh, e to the power i 2 pi n over 3 and n could be 1 to 3 here for SU3. And um, that is essentially uh, an exact symmetry if you don't have quarks in the system, so if you could assume, uh, think of quarks as being infinitely heavy. And there is an order parameter for this symmetry, and it's called the Polyakov loop, because if this is a symmetry, then the expectation value of the Polyakov loop should be zero, because the Polyakov loop you could easily see transformed non-trivially under this symmetry. Now, this symmetry turns out to be uh, the correct symmetry of QCD at low temperature, but high temperatures gets broken, uh, and the Polyakov loop value, which is essentially uh, the trace of the uh, path order at Wilson line, is non-zero at high temperature. And I, I will kind of uh, discuss that more in detail. So here, I just introduce uh, to be aware that what uh, what kind of symmetries do we have now? Uh, if you are serious, of course, you want to also to think about the QCD phase diagram, not only a section of external parameters like temperature density, but also uh, the parameters in the QCD Lagrangian, uh, for example, the up and down quark masses. And that's usually summarized in what is known uh, as a Columbia plot. So here, uh, what is shown is a phase structure of QCD as function of the light quark masses uh, on the vertical axis and the strange quark mass uh, in the horizontal axis. So we're talking about two light, U and D, and one strange quark mass. And, and now we want to understand what, uh, how, how this uh, phase structure could look like. So certainly when you go to a very a limit of very heavy quark mass, QCD reduces to a pure gluonic series, a pure ga gauge theory. And therefore, uh, in the limit of infinitely heavy quark mass, we have an exact symmetry, a Z3 symmetry. And uh, that uh, symmetry then uh, produces you a first order phase transition. So in this corner of the phase diagram, or this point of the phase diagram, you know that you have a first order phase transition. And as you uh, go from infinite quark mass to finite quark mass, it's like turning on an external field, you make this first transition weaker until it disappears. And, and uh, of course, there is then a critical uh, line of critical points or the critical line, uh, which separates this first order region from the crossover region. And that, that uh, typically belongs to Z2 universality class. Uh, and then, of course, for kind of intermediate quark masses, the transition is crossover because simply there is no symmetry. Uh, so the this symmetry is gone. You, as you always a quark mass, so there is no symmetry for which you could uh, relate a phase transition to. Except when you go to very low quark masses, and then the chiral symmetry becomes relevant. So, and then the question is what happens here? So, uh, if you go to uh, the case of three degenerate quark masses, so the, uh, which are all three degenerate and almost zero quark masses, so this corner of the phase diagram, you have a first order phase transition, and it's first order because there is no universality class uh, based on the symmetry which, for which you could uh, 
uh, have a second order phase transition. So in this limit, uh, the QCD uh, has an SU3 cross SU3 symmetry, and there is no universality class uh, which would uh, give you a, uh, a first, uh, second order phase transition. So, and because the chiral symmetry is exact in the massless limit, you should have a phase transition. So it must be then a first order phase transition. But again, first order phase transition is not something that washed out immediately if you. Uh, break the symmetry by an external parameter, which you could think of an exact uh, some sort of magnetic field. It persists up to the point that it becomes uh, again uh, a critical line, uh, which belongs again to Z2 universality class. If you go to, uh, if you make the heavy quark very large, uh, so essentially you have to only two light quarks, so you could consider this part of the diagram, then uh, in principle, you could have a second order phase transition because SU2 is isomorphic for all four, and all four is a known universality class in spin models. So you could think of the two flavor theory or even two plus one flavor theory if the strange is heavy enough as, as a chiral, having a chiral transition which is uh, analogous to uh, all four spin uh, tra phase transition in all four spin models. So I will be talking therefore in a universality class. And what we get from recent lattice calculations that in, in fact explicit lattice calculation shows that there is indeed this property of QCD chiral transition which is uh, reminiscent of, which essentially says that it belongs to the same universality class. Now, more importantly, if you go to the physical point, you are here, so you're away from uh, this, uh, this part or obviously the second order phase transition and you are in the crossover region, and that's again something which is established by lattice QCD, and we'll show some more details later in the lectures. Okay, so that uh, brings me to the outline of the lectures, and uh, here I uh, will talk about the numerex topics, so in what follows uh, in the next uh, remaining, uh, I don't know how much time I have, so I've been speaking for almost uh, for half an hour. Uh, do you keep time? So how, how much I've been taking so far? 50 minutes? Okay, good. So in the remaining half an hour, I, I will probably won't cover all of it, but I will try to cover as much as I can. So I will uh, talk about uh, the basic of field theory at finite temperature. Uh, and the weak coupling expansion, so how, how one would approach uh, calculating the uh, pressure, uh, how, how one would calculate the QCD pressure in the weak coupling expansion. I will talk about the dimension reduced effective field theory, uh, which is also goes under the name of EQCD. Uh, I will talk about effective field theory at low temperature, as well as the relativistic virial expansion. And then I will, only then I will turn to lattice QCD where I will explain first the basics of lattice QCD. I will discuss the deconfinement transition absence of quarks, uh, chiral transition in QCD, equation of state, uh, deconfinement uh, and color screening in full QCD, which is distinct from the deconfinement in pure gauge theory because here you don't have uh, an explicit Z3 symmetry. Uh, and then we'll, we'll talk about the non-perturbative aspects of uh, high temperature QCD and those are related dominantly to magnetic screening, which is not something you have in ordinary plasma. I will touch upon uh, QCD at non-zero uh, chemical potentials by means of Taylor expansion and then if I will have time I will talk something about the spectral function and heavy quality diffusion, which is relevant for heavy ion experiments. Okay, so let me now uh, after this kind of broad introduction, let me just uh, go through the basics of uh, quantum statistical mechanics. Uh, and many of these things is just, we'll try to be brief because uh, many of these things you have learned in various graduate courses. Uh, and that has to do with uh, pass integral formulation of quantum mechanics and uh, pass integral formulation of quantum statistical physics. So uh, it's well known right, that the transition amplitude in quantum mechanics can be represented by pass integral. So if you take a transition amplitude between two states uh, in coordinate uh, representation Q at time T and Q prime at time T prime, so you have to evaluate this matrix elements, so essentially do uh, 
a standard evolution, quantum mechanical evolution, and the question is how do we evaluate these matrix elements? Uh, of course, you could do it in real time, but for us it will be interesting to work in imaginary time, and if, typically for numerical simulation you have to work in, uh, in uh, imaginary time, so you just continue the time variable to i tau, and tau being now the imaginary time Euclidean time, um, and now, of course, you end up with a, the same uh, expression, uh, but now in the Euclidean time, and, and this uh, 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 kind of evolution operating quantum mechanics becomes now just a pure exponential function, which already kind of reminds you of something you see in statistical physics. So we will consider simple Lagrangians of one degree of uh, freedom uh, related to coordinate Q. So the, uh, the Hamiltonian is one over P squared, so P is a momentum, and some potential V Q. So for that, that type of Hamiltonian, you could derive the past integral representation of uh, your transition amplitude now in Euclidean time between points Q prime and point Q at time tau and tau prime. So now uh, we go to statistical mechanics. So what we are interested in is evaluating the partition function. Uh, beta being the inverse temperature is just a trace of statistical operator. And you could also express the partition function as kind of sum of all the eigenstates of Hamiltonian, uh, En. So En is now uh, just a state, uh, the eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. So we have to evaluate this uh, trace of the statistical operator, essentially using the path integral. So that's the goal. And of course, uh, from what I said, it's pretty clear that uh, you could uh, just think of it as just integration of, uh, of your amplitude, transition amplitude, but now between the same, very same states and, and kind of traced over or integrated over all the states. So you could write the partition function in terms of path integral of this transition amplitude, where the Q now is what used to be the initial and final state, but you have to integrate all over the same. And, and because you're integrating Q, uh, so the, the starting point and the end point is essentially the same, uh, you write the path integral in this form, but now Q has to be the function Q has to be the periodic boundary condition. So at time beta, which is the inverse temperature, uh, you arrive at the same point as you started from. So essentially, what you have here is you express the partition function of one uh, of a statistical quantum statistical system with one degree of freedom in terms of path integral with the Euclidean action of this form. So it's, it's just essentially the same standard action in Euclidean space-time. And now we could, with that you could also calculate the generating function. So you could introduce a source coupled to this uh, uh, coordinate Q. And, and from that, you essentially taking the derivative, you could uh, estimate all kind of uh, two-point function of, uh, of your thermal system. Between, in, now in uh, Euclidean time, tau one and tau two. Now, of course, once you know how to do it uh, for one degree of freedom, it's not too difficult to generalize to many degrees of freedom and possible infinite degrees of freedom. So you could think of a field theory as, as kind of the continuum limit. So you could generalize first uh, this consideration from one degree of freedom Q to a set of degrees of freedom phi x, and x is now, could be a discrete variable. And now if you take x to be continuous and you go to the field theory limit, so you start with the Grangian and the simplest thing if you have uh, to consider is a, a one uh, massive scalar field uh, uh, with uh, kind of uh, quartic interaction phi to the four scalar field theory, and uh, you could work out what uh, or how you would do the path integral formulation of that one in complete analogy with what you did in quantum mechanics or quantum statistical mechanics. So you just have to keep in mind that instead of one degrees of freedom, you have no many, and this many degrees of freedom x is actually a continuous set. So, so you, essentially, you replace the sum over x by integral over these three x, right? And then you have a, a field theoretical Lagrangian in Euclidean space-time, and the partition function you could write as a functional integral. Uh, now, with a field being bosonic, has to obey a uh, periodic boundary condition in imaginary time. Uh, so phi of, of zero is, is the same as phi of beta. Now you could also take the free field limit and write down the generating function. So you first couple uh, an external source, as usual in the field theory, to your uh, 
field phi, and, and now, of course, you could uh, essentially calculate any correlation function by taking function of the root with respect to j. So if you do it uh, in the free field theory limit, you could explicitly do the integration over five fields, and then uh, you arrive at uh, the free field partition function in terms of uh, by doing Gaussian integration, and, and you get a Gaussian in terms of external sources. And this delta zero is, uh, is then the finite temperature propagator, so essentially the determinant of your uh, matrix uh, uh, between uh, different fields. And the partition function just uh, becomes uh, the trace of logarithm of this propagator. Now, the only difference is that uh, you have to obey the uh, periodic boundary condition. And because you have to obey the periodic boundary condition, when you try to solve the corresponding field equation for the propagator, for example, you, uh, in momentum space, then uh, because of periodic boundary condition, now the frequency uh, becomes something which is uh, quantized. So you have a finite extent in the time direction. So instead of continuous uh, time component of momentum variable, you have a set uh, of what is called the Matsubara frequency. So energy levels or the, the uh, zeros component of your momentum is just quantized, 2 pi t times n. And then, of course, uh, you have a pro Matsubara pro propagator, which is then uh, the same as in the Euclidean uh, uh, propagator of scalar field, except uh, the frequency or the time component is just replaced by the Matsubara frequency that takes discrete set of values. Uh, for practical calculation, of course, it's also useful to have uh, the propagator of a scalar field uh, in terms of uh, the mixed representation, so where you have, you do the Fourier transform only in, in the time, but not in space, so you have this mixed representation where you have coordinate tau and momentum k, and you just do the Fourier transformation of your uh, uh, momentum propagator in, in terms of tau, or in terms of omega, and then, then of course you could show that, that the propagator has this form, so essentially, uh, in the vacuum, you wouldn't have this f, right? Uh, and f essentially nothing else but, but the thermal part of the propagator, which is just a Bose-Einstein distribution. So that's how, uh, how of course, the Bose-Einstein distribution appears. Uh, from a field theoretical point of view, you just derive the propagator, and when you calculate it with periodic boundary condition, you see that in addition to the zero temperature part, which would be on the first piece, you also have uh, uh, the bosonic uh, or the Bose-Einstein factor is there. So with that, of course, you could now do field theory and actually calculate uh, the pressure of uh, gas of these bosons, uh, with five for the four interaction, uh, diagrammatically. And that's very simple because the structure of the field theory is so simple that you could almost do it on one page. So, uh, so the idea is that, of course, you can do Gaussian integration, so you have to expand uh, this uh, Boltzmann factor of, of uh, the Euclidean action around the field, field, field value, and then of course the coupling constant is treated as perturbation, so you could expand everything which proportional to G. So the leading order, uh, you have just this term in the expansion, and that essentially tells you that the dominant interaction is this four vertex interaction, so, four, uh, so you have four legs in a, coming into a vertex, and, and now of course when you do the Gaussian integration, essentially, that equivalent to using big theorem, where so you have to pair two of these lines in some way or another, and therefore it's pretty easy to calculate the two-point function. Uh, so the, uh, the grammatically, when you have a two-point function, you attach the external x to two of these lines, and then you have to uh, essentially uh, apply the big theorem for the remaining two, and to form a loop, so you have kind of uh, particle coming in and you have a loop around the vertex, so that's a simple loop with no momentum exchange, so it's easy to evaluate it. Uh, so when you evaluate this loop, it's just a um, propagator circling around. You have the loop integration in the three momentum and the difference now compared to the zero uh, temperature field theory, that instead of integration of uh, uh, the time component, you have a discrete sum times the temperature, so that's a Matsubara sum. So instead of integral over as a continuous uh, time component of momentum, you have to have a Matsubara sum of a discrete momentum. And of course, the sum you could easily do if you recall that you, you, could, you have this mixed representation, right? So if you have 
the sum of an integral evaluated tau t is just just essentially would give you this sum at uh, you have to take the Matsubara frequency or the, Matsub, uh, the propagator in the mixed representation evaluated at time zero. So that essentially you set time zero and you have ex explicit expression of, of your loop integral. So with this way you do the sum and you have to do just uh, the three-dimensional integral of your propagator in the mixed representation and that gives you this expression. So you have the, both the Einstein factor here and of course you have something else which is there in zero temperature which is uv divergence so when you evaluate the self energy in phi to the fourth field theory at finite temperature uh, you have two pieces you have the zero temperature which you would have anyway which is uv divergence so it tells you that you need to be renormalized as usual you have to do it also in at zero temperature and then there is a finite temperature piece related to both the einstein factor so when you do this integral in the maskless case, actually, you could do it analytically. You recover that the self energy uh, is uh, something which is proportional to g, g, um, g squared t squared, uh, to the four and twenty four, which is kind of combination of these four factorial and the, uh, and the fact combinatorial factors. So that's uh, that's the self energy in uh, kind of uh, in the phi to the four field theory. So that means that. You st even if you would start with a massive particle, massless particles, right? So, you, so to do this integral here, we uh, set the mass to explicitly to zero. The self energy is non-zero, uh, right? And uh, is proportional to the temperature squared. That means that the particle acquires thermal mass. So every everything in the heat bus will acquire the thermal mass, and that's of course something which uh, very important when when you think about uh, perturbative expansion, as you will see in the uh, next thing. So. There is this mass, and that's uh, kind of not uh, not uh, the only uh, shows up in scalar field theory. Essentially, uh, the calculation goes in very similar uh, uh, manner in uh, QCD, as you will see in a moment. Okay, so now we could also calculate the pressure. So you have to to calculate the pressure. You have to, uh, to calculate the trace of logarithm of the propagator. And then you could think of it diagrammatically as just a bare loop without any g factors. So you essentially take the log of the propagator, integrate over all modes uh, in, in spatial momentum, and have to do the Matsubara sum. So that's the first diagram. And the second diagram now is proportional to the vertex, so the first non trivial correction. And you have two of those. And there's just essentially the, uh, the, the, pro, uh, the integral of the propagator squared, right? Because it factorizes. So you just uh, take evaluate this one loop and, and square it, and that gives you the first correction. So with that, you calculate uh, the pressure of uh, phi to the four theory to be uh, pi uh, uh, squared t to the four over ninety, and that's the ideal gas. So if you just uh, calculate naively, you would get the same expression, and and then there is a first correction uh, which is proportional to g squared. So it's a pretty easy uh, calculation, you may say. But now, of course, you can go to higher loops. And as you go to higher loops, then you discover that life is not so easy because you have infrared divergences, and which are essentially peculiar uh, here to finite temperature. So let's consider this uh, diagram. So it's a, a, essentially the same diagram as before, but now we go to three loops. We have two couplings, right? So we have three loops and, and, and come additional coupling of just the squared. So you have these two diagrams, which we know kind of before. So here uh, we have just one loop uh, with one single propagator going around. You integrate and sum over all the Matsubara modes, and you have two of them, so it's squared. And the propagator in the, uh, and, and the part in the middle, it's one propagator. Well, it's two propagator, right? Because you have one from here and another one from the other side. Uh, so we have a propagator squared. Uh, and again, the same uh, same loop integration versus uh, and summation. Now, what you discover is that this middle part, if you set L to equal zero, so it just takes a, a, a zero mode in this uh, Matsubara sum, so L equals zero term is infrared divergent uh, because essentially it behaves like D3P over P to the four. So this diagram divergent, and that's not all. You could go to the four loop diagram of this sort, is, is essentially the same as in, just inserting one more kind of uh, loop here, which, uh, and then of course, again, you have these three loops, right? Each of them has one single propagator integrated around. So that's gives you this expression, which is cubed. And in the middle, you have now three propagator, one, two, between these two vertices and the third one. 
And again, if you evaluate uh, this integral for the first term, so again, the zero uh, frequency, much better frequency r equals zero term, you get the infrared divergence, which is even more severe because now you have uh, six uh, powers in the uh, denominator and, and only three uh, integration, these three p's. So, and of course you could repeat and you see that you have more and more severe divergences as you go to higher loops. So, so now you have to do, clearly do something about it. And uh, fortunately, because uh, you have this relatively simple structure that adding all, all these bubbles just gives you an extra propagator uh, integrated over to the power n, you could essentially resum all these diagrams uh, exactly as essentially if you kind of, because all these diagrams are essentially just a self-energy contribution. And so because of that, you could resum them exactly. And when you do this resummation, uh, you get something odd, right? Because now the, the contribution of all this infinite series of diagrams, instead of being suppressed, each high diagram being suppressed by power, you have to resum all that, and that gives you a factor g squared to the power three halves. So instead of having expansion in g squared, as you would think naively, now you have an odd power uh, in, in the coupling G, uh, namely G cubed. So, uh, what it means is there are collective effects in, in this uh, high temperature uh, scalar field theory, so in this high temperature scalar plasma, if you wish, that need to be uh, taken into account to all orders. And when you try to do it by resumming this diagram, it gives you an odd powers in the coupling constant. So you could now add all this to them together up to this far, and that's what the perturbative uh, expression look like. So you have the first non-trivial correction, which is kind of well-behaved. It's just an innocent G-squared correction, which you kind of, from naive power counting, would expect. And then the resummation of the next type of diagrams give you an odd power. And of course, you could go on and calculate higher order, which has been done. Uh, but the important point here is that you have infrared sensitivity in, in the zero matter mode, and which kind of uh, needs resummation of certain class of diagram. In this case, it's called the ring diagrams, which you can do. And the story is basically the same also in uh, uh, QCD. Yes. So, so let's go first. So, the, so, the, 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 so I mean, in some sense, you have one type of this is a certain class of diagram. So, so the first diagram in that series, right? It's is this one, right? Uh, and that is, say, uh, is is kind of well behaved because you have just two kind of uh, one integration, one uh, uh, one integration and one propagator, right? Yeah. It's squared. So that's simple. Then, of course, the next one it becomes problematic if you have two, uh, two of these, and then, of course, in the middle, you have two propagators, and because of these two propagators, yes. it, it has a uh, singularity. And then, then, of course, as you go to higher order, then you have more and more. So when you resum, then, of course, you have to subtract the first one, right? And, but that, that's, that's, of course, the G to the... So, so this sum, in a, in a sense, starts from n equal 2, so n equal 1 is not included. So you have at least to have two of these uh, additions. Uh, if, if that, that was, it's, I don't know if that was your questions. Um, I mean, um, are we trying to um, exclude the IR divergence part uh, by resumming the diagrams, right? Yeah, so, so you see, right, so, so what, what you do here, right, so how, how, how you could say, so okay, you see, here you have C divergence, you have to do something about it, and you realize it's not only particular to this diagram, but it's kind of a whole class of diagrams. So each higher order generate more and more. So you, you kind of realize also that, that that divergence is related to the fact that here we have massive propagator, right? If there would be a mass here, that would, wouldn't be a problem. But we said, well, let's consider a massless uh, uh, scalar field, probably having in mind QCD where the gluon doesn't have a mass. So for massless, it's divergent. And in a sense, what you do, right, is let's say, well, this 
the summation of this diagram is essentially nothing else, but if you think of this as a propagator, right, uh, then each of these uh, bubble, which we insert here, is just a self-energy insertion. So if instead of kind of thinking of them as uh, kind of inserting self-energy one by one, I could say, well, why don't I use with a propagator which includes the self-energy itself? So essentially, I could do a three-level calculation. So I just evaluate this one uh, reading order diagram, but the propagator, uh, let me draw this double line, the propagator here would be something like uh, omega n, uh, squared plus omega, uh, or let's, let's say just p squared because the mass I neglect is a mass plus the self energy which I calculated, right? And because the self energy, right, it's, it's just a constant, it acts like a mass. So that's why I'm saying that, that uh, when you calculate the self energy, right, the fact that it, it just it has a simple form, it really acts like a mass. Because once I know that that's my self-energy, I can just plug in and, and do the calculation, the one-loop calculation with the sum propagator. And eventually, this diagram, if you would expand now in, in pi, right, then it will generate a series exactly what I have here. I have one bubble, two bubble, three bubbles, and et cetera, as many as you want. Yes. So essentially, essentially replacing the naive propagator with the propagator that contains the self-energy essentially generates this, these diagrams. Okay, so we sort of uh, add mass to the propagator so that yeah, the mass and propagator. so that the uh, things uh, are not right. higher divergent. Okay. Yes, of course. Of course, you have to be consistent not to do the double counting, but but uh, we could discuss it later how it's done. So it's 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 you don't simply add; you just rearrange the perturbation series such that your leading order expression becomes uh, or the leading order propagator sort of say has to be of, of this massive form. Other questions? All right, thank you then. That was a good question. Uh, let me continue. Okay, so you could do this calculation uh, now uh, continuing on, right? And, and, and that has been done uh, by several people, so in particular uh, by Arnold and Sai in, in 1904. And here's the expression of, of the uh, pressure of a scalar field series, so it starts with ideal P, so I factored it out, and then you have the first correction, uh, uh, this odd power in G, uh, which is kind of a fractional power in alpha, so I introduce in kind of having QCD in mind, and alpha here, then you go to the three loop, you get a running coupling effect, and then, then uh, you have, you could even go to higher order, the, the uh, fifth order, so you have alpha to the five half, and, and Actually, even, even you can go even further, and uh, recently that also has been done. So uh, you have the perturbative series, you may say, to high enough order, and you look at the convergence, it doesn't look particularly good. So first of all, here I, I show the pressure of scalar field theory normalized by one. Uh, so the first correction G squared, if you go to large coupling, it's negative, so it decreases, but it's it's not particularly big, it's like 10% effect. And then you go to higher order, and then the, uh, the corresponding corrections uh, come kind of oscillate in sign and become significant. So you get uh, kind of each correction going up and down, so there is no apparent convergence. So it's not like like uh, as you increase, uh, high, you go to higher power in G, it's going to converge to some results. It just fluctuates up and down to around some unknown value. Now, of course, people have been thinking of how to improve this problem, and, and they suggested further reorganization of perturbation theory, which goes under the name of screen perturbation theory. And there, of course, you absorb uh, these odd powers in G into lower order uh, uh, loop expansion. And so you, you just count the loop expansion, and then, of course, you have something which goes up to three loop, and then there is apparent convergence. So you have the first one loop calculation, uh, which is kind of goes down. Then so you have the two loop and three loop, and then you may say, well, if you would calculate the four loop, which actually has been done, it will be top of the three loop. So by re further reorganizing the perturbation theory, at least in scalar field theory, you could kind of improve this convergence property and get some uh, result which has some predicting power, and that will be important when I will compare the big coupling calculation at high temperature to the lattice. So that was scalar field theory. 
so one of the problems that we will encounter later on, uh, essentially, is, is already visible in the, scale, in the example of the scalar field theory. Um, there are some additional problems uh, in QCD, which are kind of specific to non-abelian nature of the theory, but a lot of, of the things I will discuss is essentially have been shown in this example. So now, uh, let's uh, consider gauge theory at finite temperature. So again, you now carry on uh, uh, with the calculation of a partition function now for gauge. So gauge theory means, as discussed uh, earlier today, you need to fix a gauge. Um, so you have the gauge fields, and, and uh, once you do the gauge fixing, you have to introduce also the ghosts, uh, which are kind of anti-commuting scalar fields, so they satisfy uh, Fermi statistics, and therefore, uh, so the gauge fields, uh, that is just an analog of uh, the scalar fields, so you, uh, in principle, at least in the free field zero limit, they are bosons, so you have, again, periodic boundary condition for the uh, gauge fields, and the uh, ghost fields, of course, has antibiotic boundary conditions. So now everything you did in the scalar field theory in the free field theory limit is uh, basically exact, uh, exactly the same. So in the free field theory limit, you just have four components instead of one. Because you have four components of, of boson fields, you write down uh, the logarithm of a partition function. Uh, and you have color in addition, right? So, in the, in, uh, as additional quantum numbers, so so it's exactly the same expression as you would have in scalar field theory, except you have to multiply it by four, and uh, as a color factor, n c squared minus one, the number of uh, colored gluons, and you also have a ghost which have uh, come with the opposite sign, and therefore these four degrees of freedom eventually reduce to two when you do this, uh, uh, this sum integrals, or this, because here uh, sum of k, of course, means the integral if you go to the continuum, infinite volume limit, uh, and you recover essentially the same expression for the idea of gluon pressure as for the scale, in the scalar field theory, except for the number of degrees of freedom, which is two for two gluon polarization, and, uh, and c squared minus one for the number of colors. Now, uh, you could calculate, uh, oops, did I forget something, yeah. You could calculate also the self-energy of the gluon, so here it uh, becomes more complicated a bit, uh, because you have more diagrams to calculate. Oops, oops what happened? I'm going in the wrong direction. Um, so again, you could calculate uh, uh, diagram by diagram. Of course, uh, algebra is much more complicated, but the upshot is the same. You, you take uh, the infrared limit of the self-energy. So you take uh, the self-energy evaluated at zero frequency and the momentum going to zero. It's proportional to G squared, uh, T squared, and some uh, factor which depends on number of color and number of fermions. And this quantity is something which we would call the Debye mass squared. Uh, in an uh, kind of analogy of the by screening electron plasma, but it's also kind of analogous to what we calculate in, in the scalar field theory. At least for the zero zero component, now if you evaluate the same for the spatial component, if the incoming gluon is spatial, then uh, if you evaluate it at uh, zero frequency and zero uh, momentum, you get zero. So the magnetic fields are not screened. So, so there is a self-energy is finite, and of course you could now, if you take the electric propagator, which is k squared plus the self-energy, do a Fourier transform, which should give you the potential, then you realize that it gives you, instead of columbic potential, you get a screen coulomb potential, you cover potential, and the screening parameter of this potential between uh, two s s charges uh, is essentially given by the Debye mass. So the upshot is that uh, chromoelectric fields are screened, in uh, in the uh, finite temperature QCD with the screening mass given by the Debye mass, but the chromomagnetic fields are not screened, at least not in perturbation theory. So now again, if you go to temperature which is much higher than lambda QCD, you could try to calculate the QCD pressure in perturbation theory, and the calculation uh, to large extent is analogous to 
uh, the calculation is just showed in the scale of field theory. You will now, based on experience, you will kind of already see that there will be infrared divergences, uh, but those can be resummed. And to do the resummation, essentially, what uh, what you have to do to avoid those infrared divergences, resum the diagram, is to add a mass term for the gluon fields, uh, more precisely to uh, the zero components of the gluon field. And the way you do it, you don't just simply uh, make it massive, you add such a term, such a mass, mass, uh, mass term to the your original Lagrangian and subtract it, right? So essentially, you didn't change your Lagrangian, but the added term, you will make the gluon propagator massless, and the subtracted term you could treat as an additional counter term. So it's additional vertex with only two gluons coming in. And as of course, if you look diagrammatically, what it boils down to is that in, uh, on top of these naive diagrams, right, this one-loop diagram where you have one gluon fields go around, then you have a uh, goes going around, and then of course you have corrections, so that's, that's a kind of a familiar one, it comes from a four-gluon vertex, now you have three gluon vertex produces this diagram at uh, two loop level. You also have to take a diagram where you have the counter term, so this mass term subtracted now and uh, kind of with a gluon combined, so this one insertion here. But because the electric fields, electric gluons are massive, that doesn't produce any infrared divergence uh, yeah, in any of those. Uh, uh, and the subsequent diagrams, when, when you set the Matsubara when you take the Matsubara frequency to be equal to zero. And of course, the three loop diagrams, you have many more. So, all these diagrams here. And of course, if you take QCDs and, and addition, you have the fermionic diagrams as well. Okay, so again, you could kind of uh, write down the time expression, and it's shown here. So, it's looks pretty complicated if you calculate up to G to the fifth order. I don't want to memorize it, I just want to point out uh, kind of a few important things of the, about the structure of this expression. So obviously, the first term is ideal gas, so it's factored out. Then you have, as essentially this term just not proportional to the coupling constant, that's just the ideal gas part. Then you have the first non-trivial correction at two loop. Uh, you have uh, the corrections uh, uh, due to the, the biomass, so that's a first odd correction, which uh, essentially comes from the resumming the propagators. It's odd in G, uh, in G, so it's G cubed. And then you have a bunch of corrections at G to the fourth, and finally G to the fifth. So G to the fourth, uh, G cubed and G to the fifth, which are odd, they come from the zero Matsubara frequency. And G to the fourth, here is an interesting one, which has this logarithmic, and you kind of recognize here you have CA, which is just a number of colors, or essentially that's a Casimir in the, uh, in the joint representation, and the other factors, which if you combine, you recognize here as a coefficient in the logarithm giving you a one loop uh, beta function of QCD. So essentially, the role of, of this G to the four uh, loop is to take into account the running coupling constant in the pressure. So obviously, the, run, uh, the first correction. Uh, to the ideal pressure is proportional to G squared, but G squared depends on the scale. So, of course, depending on what, what you get for the scale or what you put in for the scale, you could say, well, it's a typical thermal momentum, so it's a order of T, your results will depend. But, of course, nothing could depend on the renormalization scale, so it has to be compensated when you go to higher order. And the renormalization scale dependence of your first non-trivial correction to the pressure gets compensated in principle by this term, which is proportional to the beta function. So that's the first time you see the running coupling effects uh, in, in the pressure explicitly. So this term, the mu scale dependence of this term compensated by that one. But in effect, it means that, that G to the fourth is, is just captures the very first non-trivial uh, effects of the running coupling constant. Of course, the running coupling constant two loop is not even here, despite the fact that it's a lot of diagrams that we calculated. So despite the fact that there are a lot of calculation, uh, this expression one should be aware of. It's not very accurate because it only contains uh, the running coupling at one loop. Now you could again analyze the convergence, and here I show different orders of uh, perturbation theory. So G squared term, uh, as before, gives you a negative contribution. So that's a leading order, as in the scalar field series, so it subtracts from the ideal uh, gas pressure. So what is shown here is the pressure normalized 
of pressure of QCD normalized by the ideal gas pressures. Then you have the G cube term, which is large positive. Uh, and uh, then, then uh, again, you have G to the fourth, which goes down, and G to the fifth go up. So again, you have this oscillating behavior. Uh, so, and typically this large fluctuation as you go to higher order in G is related to appearance of the odd powers. Now, uh, again, people have been thinking of uh, trying to re uh, rearrange uh, this perturbative series uh, in a better way, and uh, that goes under Hassel Malupris sum perturbation theory, and you absorb some of the odd powers in G to lower orders, and he, then when you do it, you have uh, kind of the leading order results, so the one loop result, which includes now the G cube term. Uh, you have the next leading order result, the next to next to leading order result, which is this blue line. And uh, while it's not convergence, but you see that the scale uncertainty is sort of reduced and you get something which is as function of the temperature appears to be constant, which actually what, or what also the lattice calculation suggests. So you get something which is, in the view of lattice calculation, looks more reasonable. And uh, I think uh, in the next week or maybe this week, uh, uh, Tony Rapham will kind of explain more how these calculations are done. So he will give a dedicated reaction on Hasser mode. Uh, Okay, so we understand now how the perturbation theory done in, in scalar field theory as well in QCD, but there is one important difference uh, and one important problem in QCD which doesn't appear, uh, let's say, in scalar field theory or in QED, and that's related to the magnetic mass and infrared, further infrared divergence is related to the, uh, which are related to the magnetic mass. So let's consider kind of a generic L-loop diagram of this sort, and now uh, assume that all the lines here are non-electric, but, but magnetic, so they're really massless because at one loop uh, we didn't generate any any effective mass for the spatial gluons. So if you analyze this diagram, uh, you will see you just can count the number of loop integrals. So number of loop uh, integrations will be now we, I put them uh, Matsubara most to zero, so just think of them as as a static part of of, of the your uh, loop, uh, so you have L plus one loops, and, and the uh, propagator, uh, the number of propagators is uh, 3L, so, uh, so you have P squared plus magnetic squared, so I put the infrared magnetic mass as an infrared regulator, it's not that I know that there should be one, but I put just in there, and uh, then you have uh, in the uh, uh, numerate, uh, denominator you have 3L, if you just count the, all, the loops, uh, all the propagators in this loop. And of course, you have the vertices, and the vertices give you uh, a p over 2L. So now you could analyze this uh, generic diagram at uh, 1 and 2 loop, and at 1 and 2 loop, they're all finite, as, as also in scalar field theory, so there's no, no infrared divergence. If you go to 3 loop, then you have an infrared divergence, uh, and you have g to the 6, t to the 4, and there is a logarithmic sensitivity to this infrared cutoff, which I put here, just, just to make the expression finite. But if you go to higher loop, uh, then you get an expression is, which is, looks like this, or proportional to this. Uh, so it uh, has a g to the 6, t to the 4, and then g squared t squared divided the magnetic mass to the power L minus 3. Now, of course, we know that uh, uh, the magnetic mass uh, cannot be of order g t, because we calculate it explicitly, and at, at order, at the fun loop order, there is no magnetic mass. So if you have a magnetic mass, it, at least it should be uh, of order g squared t. Now, if the magnetic mass is of order g squared t, you plug it in, then you see that starting from 3 loop and above, all, the, all these diagrams have exactly the same contribution, right? Because g squared t divided by magnetic mass, it just gives you 1. So at order g to the 6, each loop uh, contributes the same amount. So there is infinite number of loops contributing to the pressure starting at order g to the 6. Uh, so that means that, that beyond g to the 6, really, uh, strictly speaking, this loop expansion is not applicable. So the naive weak coupling expansion doesn't work. And uh, you have to do something else. So that is known as a Linde problem. And essentially means that uh, the QCD pressure, even at infinite temperature, is non-perturbative because you cannot calculate it using the simple or the naive weak coupling expansion where you expand around the loop. As I will show in a moment, 
It's also related to the fact that static chromomagnetic fields at very high temperature are somehow confining. Uh, and therefore, as I said, uh, you have these non-perturbative aspects of quark gluon plasma or the QCD pressure, even at very high temperature. And the other problem, which, which is kind of, uh, kind of as a practical level, you would say, well, it's g to the 6, so it's, it's high order, so who cares? I I'm, I'm still have enough orders to calculate or estimate the QCD pressure. The problem is that in practical application, g is not so small. In fact, since the powers, uh, since the expansion of the pressure is in powers of g and not of s, uh, that makes the situation worse. So in order the weak coupling to be well behaved, you have to make G to the small. But now you estimate the G at very high temperature, let's say, of order the electric scale. So you plug for renormalization scale something like 10 to the uh, 2 GV. So if order the W boson mass, you estimate uh, running coupling knowing uh, the value of lambda QCD, which is about 300, and you get a number which is order one. So the coupling G, uh, in QCD, even at the electric scale is of order one, and in, in really to go to having really small, uh, let's say if you go to Planck scale, you have to go something to like uh, grand unification scale to have G, which is one half, which you could uh, can uh, consider to be very small. So in, in essence, uh, while we coupling calculation in QCD gives you some qualitative understanding what might be going on, does any of this coupling calculation is uh, useful in practice is is kind of not clear at all because if it's really expansion in G, then you really have to go to grand unification scale to really trust your recoupling expansion. As you will see, it's not that bad in many cases, but but that that you don't know a priori. So essentially, without the lattice calculation, you cannot go very far. Okay, so now. Uh, uh, how do we understand uh, these infrared divergences maybe in somewhat different language in the language of vector field theory? So I already mentioned that these infrared divergences come from the fact that if you isolate in this loop integral the zero Matsubara sum, then, uh, then you get uh, uh, diagrams which are infrared divergent. Now, of course, you could think in terms of the big coupling as, as having different scales. So if we also seen that, that uh, essentially what you generate at one loop is something of a scale, which is for, or there's a thermal mass or the Debye mass of the GT. So you could think, and, um, uh, and on top of that, there is in QCD, there is an additional scale, which you could associate with magnetic mass, which is one order higher, which is G squared T. So it's really a cause for the use of effective series. So you have distinct scale in the problem. So you have the typical thermal scale for the two pi T. You have the Debye mass or the kind of typical thermal mass in the plasma for the GT, and, and in QCD you have additional non-perturbative scale at very high temperature, which is G squared T. So if G is small, uh, the scale are different, uh, is are well separated, so you could now formulate an effective theory for QCD thermodynamics where you start to integrate out the largest scale, the 2 pi T, and then for the infrared sector have some effective field theory. So what you could do in practice, you write your uh, four-dimensional field, or some generic field phi, in terms of Matsubara decomposition, and when you insert this Matsubara decomposition in your original uh, Euclidean action, then you see that it corresponds to essentially a set of uh, massive fields with mass 2 pi t, some interaction and the kinetic term, but that, that's essentially a three-dimensional field theory, but with many, uh, uh, infinitely many uh, massive fields. But if these fields are massive, I could integrate them out and I get an effectively a three-dimensional description of uh, the uh, infrared sector of, of thermodynamics. So, so when you do it, so you could, in, in principle, do an explicit uh, integration of your hard modes in the past integral. So you, you could kind of carry out explicitly the integration of n non-zero modes, so non-zero Matsubara modes in the past integral and derive its effective theory for the zero Matsubara modes. And what you see is that this integration procedure of non-static modes le leads you to a mass term in the uh, zero Matsubara mode. And of course, if you go to QCD, you also have to realize that uh, the electric field becomes a special in the sense that, that you just look at this covariant derivative the, the, in the definition of field strength tensor. If the field is static, right, then there is no time derivative. 
So the A naught field essentially becomes a joint scalar. So you immediately could write down the kinetic part of your Lagrangian of effective theory as a kind of a standard Young Mills term in the three dimension. Uh, the electric field A naught, because there is no time derivative involved, just becomes a joint scalar. And the integration of the non zero Matsubara mode essentially gives you the Debye the mass. And you could also generate additional terms which, uh, where the scalar field is self interacting at higher orders in G. Now, because you go from three dimension to uh, from four dimensions to three dimension, of course, now you have to, have to rescale the, the fields, and the proper rescaling is with the inverse powers of the temperature. So you have to rescale the original fields by one half to get the dimension right. So you get essentially a three dimensional field theory. But because it's three dimension and you did this rescaling, the coupling constant becomes dimension full. So the coupling constant G3, it just becomes G squared T. Uh, the Debye mass, as we discussed, of order GT, and then at higher order, you could generate self interaction from the loop diagrams. Now, if you look at this theory, and unless you have kind of spontaneous symmetry breaking due to the, the scalar sector, but that's obviously excluded given that the Debye mass is positive, it's really a uh, gauge theory in three dimension coupled to an adjoint scalar. And this field theory, of course, confining. So we know that, that uh, in three dimension, uh, uh, non abelian gauge theory is confining. So it has essentially an, a string tension uh, uh, and all the, all the confinement properties. So you could say that this infrared problems uh, of uh, your QCD, which we uh, associate with static magnetic sector, is just a manifestation of the fact that the underlying effective field theory for the soft modes is a confining theory. And therefore, at any high temperature, this confinement, uh, uh, three-dimensional confinement, I should say, is still uh, exist. And of course, the scale of this confinement is not given now by lambda QCD, but, but uh, a, a different scale, which was generated dynamically uh, in the C, by the series, and that is the scale of, of the coupling constant G squared T. So this idea that you have a magnetic scale regulator is actually not wasn't that off because actually there's the only scale uh, in this Lagrangian, which as it's non-perturbative, is a coupling of the dimension full coupling or self-coupling of, of these three-dimensional gauge fields. So uh, of course, uh, we, if you have the field theory, the advantage is that you could now separate the problem, right? So the, the problem of treating uh, the high momentum modes or, or the non-static modes of order two pi t, you could do in principle, perturbatively, because those are safe. And this uh, three-dimensional sector, which, which has this confinement, you could treat on the lattice. So instead of treating the entire QCD on the lattice, you could only treat the dimensional uh, really reduced sector. Uh, and this, this uh, kind of dimensional reduced sector is often referred to as electrostatic QCD, because you have, in addition to the gauge field, you have the electrostatic uh, uh, A naught field in there. In principle, you could do this field, uh, uh, you could calculate this uh, effective field theory on the lattice as well and match it to the perturbative calculation of the non static Matsubara mode to uh, calculate the pressure. And that has been worked out in several papers by Brat and Nieto, and as well as the Kayanti and his collaborator. Now, in this framework, of course, if you want to do like that, uh, you could, of course, as I said, calculate the free energy of QCD perturbatively on the, in the non static sector and then. Uh, there's a three-dimensional sector you could, in principle, calculate either perturbatively up to certain order, but only up to order g to the uh, six. And, and all the odd powers are then contained in the static sector. So you kind of separated the problem of bad convergence in this approach by putting everything in the, non, in the static sector, and the non-static sector still has a standard perturbative uh, expansion in, in terms of uh, even power of g squared. Now, if you really believe this scale hierarchy, right? Then, then you also realize that this MD bar mass of which of order GT is much larger than, than the other intrinsic scale of the problem, the three-dimensional coupling. So in principle, you could imagine integrating out also the Debye mass. In that case, the three-dimensional pressure will be depend only on one uh, dimensional parameter, and that's, that's this, this three-dimensional coupling constant. And for dimensional full reason, it should be G to the six. So you could see that all the information about uh, static magnetic fields uh, is essentially encoded in uh, 
in the stat in, in the static uh, sector. So it's it's kind of by dimension for uh, the, the um, uh, dimensional analysis you could deduce as a non perturbative contribution to the static sector is has to be of order g to the six simply because in uh, this effective theory where you integrated out a zero called uh, not a static QCD, the so only dimension of quantity is the three dimensional coupling. And by dimensional analysis, you just get that this coupling constant to the six should be, should be uh, which gives the dimension of, of the free energy. Okay, so I have five more minutes. Uh, so I, at least I could uh, give you some flavor of what can be done in uh, low temperature. Um, so it's sufficiently low temperature, of course, as I said, the dominant degrees of freedom will be pound. They have the Goldstone boson of QCD. And therefore, if you really think of the quark mass that can vary and, and make it uh, infinitesimally small, essentially pounds will be the lightest, by far the lightest degrees of freedom. But even in physical, uh, value, for, even for physical value of the quark masses, you have a power mass which is really uh, far lighter than any hadron mass of this 140 MeV. So really, if you uh, think about thermodynamics at low temperature, it's really about the pions. Now pions, as I said, uh, because of chiral symmetry, they interact weakly, so their interaction essentially proportional to the derivatives. So if you look in the momentum space, the pions like the phi to the fourth theory, but the interactions are suppressed or, or proportional to the momentum squared uh, of the pions over f squared. And f squared is, a, is, is a, essentially the pion decay constant, the fundamental parameter of chiral perturbation theory. So we, if you have this kind of diagram, uh, you, you essentially can do the same calculation now, or similar, well, not the same, but the similar calculation for the pressure of a pion gas, which is essentially a uh, low temperature approximation of the QCD pressure. As for the scalar field theory, with the only difference that now the vertex is different, so it's momentum dependent. But the diagrammatically, it's pretty similar. The additional difference is that because you have derivative couplings and the theory is not really normalizable, at each order you have to add a you know, counter term. So this calculation has been done by Gerber and Whitefiller up to three loops. So those are the diagrams that go into the calculation. And when you calculate the, uh, the pressure of a pion gas, you get the ideal uh, gas pressure. So it's a pi squared over t to the 4 over 30, and 30 not 90 because you have three pions, so two charge and one neutral pion, so just counting the number of degrees of freedom. And then you have a three loop, in, if you go to the chiral mix, then you get the first corrections, and you see that these corrections, when you the temperature is low, is actually uh, is, is pretty small, right? So, so the interactions of pion is suppressed as temperature to the 4 divided F uh, to the 4 the pound decay constant. So if the temperature is smaller than pound decay constant, that's a small correction. So, so here we see explicitly that hadronic interactions are weak at low temperature, and essentially the pressure can be calculated uh, at a really low temperature in, in uh, this uh, chiral perturbation series, so in, in using the fact that pions are weakly coupled. Of course, there is a practical problem Namely, that if is uh, this expansion applicable in practice? So, if you put f uh, parameters, so the, uh, essentially the pound decay constant to be a 90 MeV, then you see that if the temperature for 100 MeV, it's not at all clear if that will be a small correction. So, you have to do something else. Um, so, the idea is that you could think, or if you think of it in a different way. Uh, Namely, namely the fact that at low temperature, even though the interaction is not necessarily weak, the particle uh, uh, density are relatively small, right? So if the particle density is small, then the interaction uh, will be proportional to the powers of the uh, uh, particle densities. So in a sense, you could uh, generalize the idea of virial expansion where you start with ideal gas, and you start to go uh, at the interaction as correction, which go as as proportion, being proportional to the density. And uh, that approach was generalized to the relativistic case, where, of course, instead of kind of potential between different particles, uh, you have to uh, use the S matrix of scattering processes 
Uh, and that uh, kind of how to do that, that was kind of discovered by Desch and Maher and Bernstein a long time ago. So essentially start with a free particle, then you exp took the uh, second virial coefficient, and the second virial coefficient essentially is given by uh, the S matrix of the scattering process. So if you somehow know the S matrix of the scattering process, for example, by analyzing the experimental data, in principle, uh, for not too high temperature, you could uh, um, predict what, what are the correction to the pressure are. So, uh, and here you don't have to rely on any V-coupling expansion. You just have to know what the S matrix of scattering is. Um, so now, uh, if you have, but the, the, of course, the obvious problem is that, of course, you never know exactly what, what the S uh, scattering matrix, even if analyze all the possible data on scattering processes, you don't know in general what the scattering S uh, matrix is. Now, the simplification, because in many cases, the dominant channel is elastic scattering, is energy is not too high. So you could, almost done, you could uh, just express as, uh, the S matrix in terms of phase shift and the degeneracy factors. So essentially, you do a partial wave decomposition of your S matrix and uh, write down the simple form form of the S matrix. And then you could calculate uh, the leading video coefficient uh, explicitly in terms of the integral of some Bessel function and uh, the scattering matrix as a derivative of the, of the scattering phase shift with respect to energy. Now, if you have enough information about the scattering phase shift, then of course you could, in uh, principle, go with this uh, um, video coefficient. And here I show the analysis, so that analysis has been done again a long time ago. So. Uh, in the work by Venegupo and Prakash, and what they did, they just took the experimentally known phase shift for pines and kaons uh, and tried to essentially calculate the video coefficient from it. So if you look at uh, the phase shift of pine and pine scattering here, then you have three different channels. And of course, it's not obvious what's going on, but now if you sum all, all, uh, all these channels according to the spin isospin degeneracy, you get some a curve like this, and if you see a phase shift like this, you know what, uh, what it means. Essentially, it means that there is a resonance. So if after summing all the possible phase shift, the dominant one, or, or the, the sum, essentially dominated by uh, a resonance in, this, uh, in the, uh, this scattering phase shift. So essentially, when you take the derivative of this curve, you get a, something which is close to the delta function. And, and of course, we know what this resonance is as a row mass or the row resonance in pine spine scattering. So uh, you could replace all these phase shifts essentially by one resonance in this case. You could also do the same exercise for pion, kaon scattering. And here uh, you have, again, several different phase shifts with different structures. Some have resonances, some just have continuum. You sum again, and you see that, uh, again, the phase shift shows this kind of rapid rise here and there, so there's also the two prominent resonances in pound K scattering. So what you see is that after kind of uh, taking into account all the possible channels and summing over, uh, this uh, video coefficient, uh, which is proportional to this expression, is essentially dominated by uh, resonances. So you could say that interaction, the pound pound interaction and pound K interaction, uh, which in general kind of complicated encoding this kind of uh, complicated energy dependence of phase shift gets simplified because the dominant contribution is always a resonance. So in that sense, you could replace the interacting, ga uh, interacting uh, uh, hadron gas with a non-interacting gas of hadrons and hadronic resonances, and that's the idea of the hadron resonance gas. So essentially, in order to take into account uh, interaction in hadronic gas, you don't do a full calculation. You just look up all the resonances that happen in the, uh, which you can find in particle data group and add them those resonances as free non-interacting particle of zero width essentially the simplest thing you could do and as you will see uh, that in many cases uh, has a very uh, good description of, of what's going on in real world so it can describe the you see the thermodynamics very well i won't discuss uh, in detail i only mention that when you go to baryons so when for example that was meson meson interaction then you also want to include the baryon meson interaction or baryon baryon interaction situation become more com uh, complicated. And then it's less obvious why this hadron gas would work, but that's uh, something which I will discuss later on in the lectures. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. Inclusion of resonances. Has it anything to do with the fact that the pion and kaons are uh, goldstone words, approximate? No, it's, it, because because as a goldstone nature of the pion, right? You're talking about uh, if you look here, you're talking about pretty large center of mass energies, right? So so forget about describing this feature of of, um, of the phase shift into chiral perturbation series. So if you look where the chiral perturbation theory applies, it applies somewhere here, right? But that's not what we're interested in, right? That's a small contribution. So somehow, uh, what hydrogen resonance gas has to do in this case is just that the interaction of pions, when the, uh, the interaction is really strong and it's, it's well beyond the chiral perturbation theory, it still simplifies because the dominant interaction is reso uh, resonant-like. So essentially, as I said, what I wrote here is that although the interaction are very strong, so the system is very strongly interacting, Effectively, all this interaction is modeled by hadrons. It just happens so that uh, why it works here so well, because you see these are uh, non-overlapping resonances. So here you have one, and here you have second one, and so on. So there is no overlap. If you go to baryon uh, meson interactions, then what you, what you have is that, that you have many more channels. And because you have many more channels, of course, you don't have such a nice separation of two resonances. They sit on top of each other, and that makes it more messy. But I, I, the idea is principle the same, it just it happens to be more complicated. Here in meson sector, it's very clean because the resonance is always well separated. Any other questions? Yes, please. So uh, I have a question related to the uh, history survey that you showed in, uh, in some of your initial slides. So here you saw different old papers talking about this extreme QCD matter. So in that 1951 paper, I mean, was it, I mean, at that time, was it known that hadrons are not fundamental particle or how they conclude that at high temperature, these hadrons? Oh, they, they didn't know the hadrons, but, but remember it was in, in 50s when uh, the form factors of proton was measured, the electromagnetic form factor, so they already knew that the size of a proton was 0.8. Right. And it's not a point-like object, right? right. And Pomeranchuk looked at that, okay, if it's not a point-like, or maybe it's fundamental, but it's not a point-like object, so if it has a certain size, how you, how you could have a size mm -hmm. and a thermal kind of wavelength which is much smaller than that. So he said, well, that's impossible, so somehow something should happen, or the, the universe should stop if the temperature goes beyond certain temperature, there could be no physics beyond it because you can't accommodate this particle. Okay. It wasn't clear, it just, just uh, the only thing was clear then that somehow this uh, hadronic description, a hadronic matter cannot exist beyond certain temperature because essentially the same temperature, the thermal wavelengths will be smaller than the size of your then thought as fundamental object. So that's, so it was therefore sort of the limiting temperature that the matter couldn't be heated up beyond certain temperature in mm -hmm. hadrons. And once you discover, once you understand the hadrons are not the fundamental fields, then of course it's easy, well, it's, it just goes to quarks and gluons, which are point. Well. Yeah, that is ex exactly the question is, I mean, what does it exactly mean when they say that it doesn't exist? I mean, it doesn't mean that you cannot possibly heat it up beyond certain temperature, right? So I see. That what, as if, at least that's what there was thinking. Somehow you never reach that temperature. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I have, uh, I have uh, the question about uh, the, uh, Columbia plot, mm -hmm. where you were saying that uh, it uh, infinite uh, quark mass. Uh, there is a region of first order phase transition, and there is a dotted line. But I, I have, yeah, that. Well, the dotted line. I, ju I just wanted to distinguish these. So you have, to, you see, you have two Z two. You have a Z two here. You have the Z2 here, and also this thing is the same universality class, but the physics is different. So here, I mean, the one difference is that you always could think of, of it as some sort of spin-like model, right? If you, if you kind of integrate all the high energy degrees of freedom coupled to external fields. So the quark mass goes here, and here plays the role of a magnetic field. 
but here's a magnetic field you could actually derive an effective action uh, with a magnetic field. The magnetic field here is kind of the inverse of the quark mass, so that means that if you make the quark mass lighter, it means a larger magnetic field. Here, in this region, the magnetic field is proportional to the quark mass. So, so this dashed line is only meant that, that this Z2, which is kind of related to deconfinement and the external field that drives the system from the first order to a Z2 endpoint, is inversely proportional to the quark mass. So it's some different physics. It's coupling of the polar curve, of, if you wish, to the quark. And here it's a chiral condensate. And the coupling of the chiral condensate is a quark mass. Okay, so the dotted line is uh, not uh, second order? It's a second order. It's exactly the same second order Z2 universality class. Uh, so the universality class is different. It's the same. It was different. It's uh, the underlying microscopic physics. So that's why I use different lines. Okay, thank you. Uh, my question is related to the uh, magnetic mass that you mm -hmm. uh, introduced. So in earlier slides, you said there is no screening for color magnetic field. Yes. Like for the oh, in perturbation uh, theory, right? So in perturbation theory, what can you do? I mean, you you say, well, let's let's go and calculate the diagrams, right? So you uh, calculate the self energy of a gluon. Oops, so here it was, right? Uh, now I, I draw this dashed line. It's supposed to mean st electrostatic gluon, so electric gluon. But of course, I could do the same exactly the same calculation for magnetic gluon, right? There is no difference in diagram topology, just this line will be uh, a wiggly line. And you do this calculation, you calculate all this diagram, you get some dependence on the frequency and k, which is different from the scalar theory. But anyway, then you take the infrared limit, so you set the frequency to zero, momentum to zero. In the electric sector, you get this. In the magnetic sector, you get zero. You could go one loop higher. Uh, you get infrared divergences, but the result is the same, it's zero. So you never get a finite magnetic mass uh, uh, non-zero in perturbation theory. And, and it's better to be so because then how, if you get a magnetic mass, how you would deal with gauge invariance, right? So here it's okay because it's somehow the static limit and you could think of this electric field more like scalar, so it could have a mass, but the transverse gluon cannot have a mass. So, so so there are two things. So one is gauge invariance. So why why it would tell you that you have some should have something that to be zero and explicit loop calculation always tell you zero. Now, the fact that magnetic gluons don't have a mass term doesn't mean there is no scale associated with magnetic gluons, right? And and the proper way of thinking of this scale is really the dimension uh, now reduce effective theory when you say okay here my Lagrangian. I have some dimensionful parameter, so obviously I have the Debye mass as a dimensionful parameter. It gives the mass of the electric field, which in this effective series is a joint scalar field. But there is another dimensional parameter, right, which is associated with magnetic fields because it's a self coupling of static magnetic fields and the G3 squared. And if you calculate G3 squared essentially by dimensionful analysis, you just take, start from uh, F mu squared term of your original Q steel Lagrangian. You write it in terms of I component and zero components, so spatial and, and uh, temporal components, and you do the rescaling of the fields in order to get the proper dimension. You see that you have this, this dimension full parameter, which is a three dimensional gauge coupling squared. So it's not really a mass, if you would think, which is this, this mass scale is actually is a dimension full coupling of your three dimensional effective theory. So it's, it's, not, it's not like there is color magnetic screening at some other scale? Uh, no, the color magnetic screening is, is at this scale because that's the only scale you have left, right? So you have the Debye mass scale that we understand, and the only other scale, uh, according to this analysis, is, is just G squared, T squared, which you could call is a magnetic scale because it's somehow associated with uh, magnetic gluons, so static magnetic gluons. So that's why it's, you would call it magnetic scale, right? But it, it's kind of intrinsic non perturbative because that tells you when this interaction becomes strong, the physics become non-perturbative. So if somehow you have to take into account the self-interaction of, of the static gluons, everything will be non-perturbative because everything has to be this way by essential dimension for analysis. Right? If you don't have this, the electric field, the only dimensional for quantity here is a G3 squared, and the free energy has to be G3 squared. And if you do the kind of the power counting, you always see that any loop 
but if you do a loop expansion, always give you this. So somehow, somehow you see that the loop expansion here is not possible because if you do the loop expansion, every term by dimension uh, uh, dimensional reason has to be due to the three. You cannot get anything else. And another in slide 18, you added some mass term with the uh, gauge fields, right? In slide 18. Uh, slide 18? Yeah. Yeah, that one, static resummation. Yes, so, that's right. Okay, so that's good. So, but that's electric, right? So, so you add and subtract a mass term for A not zero squared is a delta function of omega n to zero. So when it means that when you do a static fields, so omega n is zero, then you have a mass, and for all the non-static, you don't. So that is written in a particular gauge, right? Uh, well, it's, you always do a, uh, that's in a particular gauge, that's right, but, but you always do this uh, calculation in particular gauge, so that's okay. Now, you may say, well, how on earth that uh, becomes gauge invariant, and it's gauge invariant because it's only static, right? So, so again, the proper way of thinking about this term is, again, the three-dimensional effective theory, because what happens in three-dimensional effective theory, it really becomes a scalar, right? So if, if, you, if you don't allow the electric field to be have some frequency dependence, then then of course it's just a uh, scalar field in three dimension, and in three dimension a scalar field is perfectly fine. Now, if you want to do, let's say, non-zero non-zero frequency for a node or electric field in general, uh, but small, so for the GT, then of course you that framework is not enough. You have to generalize it, and that's a hard thermal loop, which I didn't discuss. Well, I mentioned it in words, but couldn't explain it because that's kind of a topic on its own. So, in principle, you could generate like a non-local mass term, which is gauge invariant, but but it's 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 a much more complicated business. So, and that's what you have to do if you want to evaluate things which depend on the time. So here, I'm calculating the pressure; it's time independent. So I can get away by just giving the static electric field of mass, and that's gauge invariant, because you see here, this Lagrangian is gauge invariant. If I want to uh, consider electric fields, which are depend on the frequency for small frequency, much smaller than the temperature, I have to generalize this framework to include a term which is kind of proportional to MD squared, but it's not a A naught squared, but it's much more complicated. That's covariant derivative, and it's non-local. Uh, and that's, that's a hard thermal loop effective action. And what you could see is that if you take this general hard thermal loop effective action and you take the static limits and you reproduce a mass term. So that's a limiting case of much more general effective action, which can be used to uh, describe time dependent things or frequency dependent things. And I hope uh, uh, Tony Raphan will talk about it in much more detail and explain what it is. Because I, I just don't have time to cover it. Yeah. But that's how it works, right? So you have a gauge invariant, not really a mass term because it has a covariant derivative, so it's much more than a mass term. It, it has, well, the, the way you do gauge invariance in that case is that you have an MD squared, right? You have a field, field squared, and you have a covariant derivative in between. And because you have a covariant derivative, it doesn't mean that you have, uh, you resum only the mass because that would be not gauge invariant. You also have to resum the two-point vertex, uh, three-point vertex, four-point vertex, and the infinite vertex. So you always have a relation between your two-point function and higher order point function. And that's why you have a sort, sort of a border identities which, which preserve the gauge invariance. If you have only mass term, you don't have border identities which corresponds to gauge invariance. If you have a kind of a sort of mass term, but also higher order corrections to, well, or let's say higher vertex corrections, uh, in addition, this, uh, which is generated by a gauge invariant or, covariant, or gauge covariant derivative, then you could preserve the gauge identity, and that's what exactly hard thermal loop does. It, it gives you a structure which not only resum the propagator, but it also resum all the vertices in a way that you preserve gauge invariance. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>